there friends, it's Nick and the ASMR Nerd, and we're going to get to today's video in just a second, but first, I have a question to ask you, and that question is, did you happen to notice that my lighting today looks a little bit more dramatic than usual, perhaps, or maybe even a bit more professional? Well, that's thanks to this video's sponsor, Niwer. Now, you might know Niwer as makers of high-quality photography and video products, and they certainly are that, but Niwer also makes video lighting for streamers and YouTubers, and recently, Niwer hooked me up with their brand new GL1 Pro streaming key lights, and that is what is lighting me here today. What do you think? These lights are packed with features that streamers and YouTubers like myself really appreciate. At least, I certainly have appreciated them while I've been using them over the past few weeks. One thing is that they are really well made. These are thick, heavy slabs of solid aluminum that just feel really nice and feel extremely solidly made. They're going to last you forever. The physical manufacture is like extremely impressive, honestly. I was really impressed with the, the build quality of these things. But that's not all. There's all kinds of other forward-looking features that I've really come to appreciate. For one, they provide really nice, soft, even, flicker-free lighting. It's essential for people on cameras to ensure that the LED lights don't flicker, and these ones provide extremely solid and soft lighting, which makes for a professional appearance. Moreover, these lights have tons of control options. For example, you can control them with the physical buttons on the lights if you want to go that route. You can also control them using the included Wi-Fi dongle, which you can plug into your PC, or you can control them with Bluetooth or Wi-Fi from your PC or your mobile device. So I have here the Neewer app open, and you have all kinds of control options, uh, which allow you to control the color cast of the lights all the way from 2900K up to 7000K, as well as uh, the intensity of the light. You can do that on a per light basis. So, for example, if I wanted to make uh, this light over here much brighter, I can just drag that up here and ah, the searing light of day bring that back down to something a little bit more reasonable. Or let's say I wanted to uh, turn off that light over there. Very easy to do. Boom. Just like that. Or let's say I wanted to control both of them together. Well, turn them both off with the press of a button on my phone. It makes it really, really easy to control them. And you have all kinds of flexible options. And now, these lights also support the Elgato Stream Deck. So if you're a streamer who makes use of the Stream Deck, hey, Niwer has got you covered. So I've really come to appreciate these lights, the GL1 Pro from Niwer. They provide beautiful, soft, even flicker-free lighting. Oh, and did I mention, listen, listen, shh. Hear that? You don't, do you? Uh, that's that's the point. These lights don't whine in the slightest, unlike cheaper video lights that I've used where there's a high-pitched whine to the LEDs. No such whine in the newer GL1 Pros, nor do they have fans, completely fanless operation, passive cooling, which means that they are dead silent, which is critical, especially for recording ASMR content. So, in the future of the channel, as you're watching, if you see me looking even better than usual, or you see content on my desk looking nice and evenly lit, soft, flicker-free lighting, just know that 
that's the Niwar GL1 Pros at work. Uh, and I really appreciate Niwar sending those lights over, giving me a chance to, to check them out and to use them here to improve the quality of the lighting in my content. So if you are interested in picking up the Niwar GL1 Pro key light for yourself, maybe you are a YouTuber or a streamer who could make use of these fantastic lights, please check out the link down at the top of the video description. Once again, a big thank you to Niwar for leveling up the lighting in my YouTube videos and streams. Hello, my Oh, 
silly, but uh, but fun in its own way. So that's what we're looking at here. So uh, this is just the one that was on top of the pile um, when I, uh, you know, pulled it out here. Uh, this is the war raft of Kron. The war rafts of Kron, and as you can see. It is not for advanced Dungeons and Dragons or a d and It is rather simply for Dungeons and Dragons, although it is labeled as an expert game adventure. So I explained this in the last video, but there is a somewhat confusing distinction here. Um, TSR, who um, owned and uh, developed um, from its inception up until the late 90s, uh, TSR uh, debuted the game with just the basic Dungeons & Dragons rule set in 1974. But then, uh, in 1977, I think it was, they forked it into two versions. One being the base game with a simplified rule set. One and the other uh, being advanced Dungeons and Dragons with a more complex rule set focused more on the tactics and wargaming aspects, I suppose you could say. Um, and that got further developed with all kinds of additional rules and materials over the years, whereas the base game stayed uh, fairly simple, as I understand it. Eventually, those two forks came back together in 1997, when Wizards of the Coast uh, gained ownership of D&D, and they released 3rd edition. But for much of D&D's history, there were these two kind of parallel, uh, you know, sets of, of the game. Anyway, The War Rafts of Kron is for the base D&D game, but it is considered an expert game adventure for characters level 9 through 12, which is you know, getting up there. Um, and I don't know anything about this adventure. I've never played it. I've, I don't even know if I've read much about it before. Um, but it's written by one Bruce Nesmith. Uh, Bruce Nesmith. And, uh, I mostly like it because of the fun art on the front. <laughs> but we can look through it together here. And, uh, see what there is to see inside. Um, these adventures, I, I've i picked them all up secondhand, mostly from thrift stores, generally for, you know, 10 to $20 a piece, depending. This, of course, produced during the TSR era. I think this particular one is from the mid-80s, the mid-1980s. So they're always presented in this folio style, where we get the outer cover, and then inside we get the, uh, the um, you know, text of the adventure. But uh, here we have Kron, Kron, which is, I guess, some kind of settlement by the looks of it. And over here we have this hex map of the Sea of Dread. The Sea of Dread it says here underwater map. So I think the War Rafts of Kron does add rules for underwater combat. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there's a section here that says new rules for this adventure. We'll take a look at that in a moment. Um, there we go. 1984 was the year this adventure was published. Here are the palace grounds of Kron, which if you saw is situated here in the middle of Kron. And uh, so there's a detailed layout for this palace, and then something called Suthus. <laughs> Suthus. I don't know what Suthus is, but maybe it's under the ocean. Kind of looks that way, doesn't it? But of course, each of these 
maps is all gridded out so that players could make their way across them and if there was combat I guess it determines the dimensions of the room and whatnot. I see it says here Kron has a bunch of small rafts arrayed around the outside. I suppose those are the titular war rafts of Kron, perhaps. Then water. All the way around. As for the, the text of the adventure,
this here gives us the setup for the adventure. Do I read it? Sure, why not? We're here to enjoy these things. There's no rush. The adventure. This is what the DM would read, uh, I guess, to the, uh, the players to start things off. Many weeks ago, the guild masters of the island of Minrothad pulled out or put out a call for adventurers of great skill and renown. The Minrothad guilds are offering small fortunes to attract adventurers of great ability for a special quest. As you make your way to the island kingdom, you may hear or you hear many strange tales. Some say that Minrothad is beset by the empire of Thyatis to the east, an empire known for its destructive ways. Others claim that the guild masters are being driven to ruin by a roving band of pirates. One innkeeper even insists that the guild masters are searching for the mythical horn of the sea god. You spend three frightening, frightening days at sea before reaching Minrothad. Each night of the journey, strange lights dance silently over the water in the distance. Whistles and screeches pierce the quiet rhythm of the waves. A hollow, abandoned feeling settles like a blanket over your party. Once on the island, the guild masters subject your party to seven days of rigorous tests and trials. Now your party stands alone before the guild masters of Minrothad. All other adventurers were found lacking. So that kind of, you know, works with the, uh, the fact that this is a higher level adventure, right? Your characters are going to be at least level nine, probably. Although, again, if you are adapting this to a modern rule set, you could totally, you know, um, balance it for, for lower level parties, too. Once on, oh, um, the guild masters explain that sea trade has been horribly disrupted. Many ships never leave port, or many ships leave port, never to be seen again. Occasionally, a masthead or a body washes up on the shores of the island. And now, a visiting princess from the kingdom of Irendi has disappeared along with one of the ships. The guild masters, or the guild's masters, offer you a small island, six square miles, next to Minrothad, if you can rescue the princess and discover who is pirating their ships. They also offer a small sailing ship, 75 hull points, with a crew of 10 and a captain for your use. The ship is fully provisioned, including food, water, and bows and arrows. The ship is yours to keep, but the captain and sailors belong to the Minrothad Navy. So that is the, the setup for this adventure. City of Sothis. The Triton Raids. Of course, there will be Tritons. A brooding looking Triton, I suppose. Pretty piece of art. Underwater art for Kron. Sharks as well. 
there would be sharks in an undersea adventure. This looks like a bad time. The sharks look hungry. These adventurers look ill prepared. gigantic kappa like a dragon turtle yikes scary tritons maybe I don't know they look yeah, I guess they're tritons zombie tritons perhaps stands alone on the cliff, looking out towards the 
sea. Mysterious lights and ghostly hauntings have kept away the people of Salt Marsh, despite rumors of a fabulous forgotten treasure. What is its sinister secret? The sinister secret of Salt Marsh is the first installment in a series of three modules designed and developed in the UK for beginning adventurers with the AD&D rules. The adventure can be played by five to ten characters of level one to three. Again, the party sizes in these old adventures often surprise me. Like, five is what I would consider a middling to large group by modern standards and ten players. Ten players is pretty much unheard of in modern D&D, at least in my experience. A party of, you know, three to five adventurers is, is pretty comfortable. Beyond that, it starts to get chaotic. It's hard to play with a lot of people, and no one player gets that much time in the limelight, so players start to get bored or distracted or whatever, especially if you have like 10 people. That'd just be rowdy, in my opinion. I don't know, maybe have any of you ever played a D&D game with 10 people? That just seems wild, excluding the DM, of course. Alright, so, we've got a haunted house, <laughs> straight up, just tells us it's haunted. Couple of dueling pirate types here. Oh, here's another level of the haunted house, I guess. First floor, ground floor, this is the cellar and caverns, specifically. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> I'm not, I didn't know if this, I'm not sure if I knew this was here. So, um, many of these, uh, do come with little, uh, you know, handouts, perforated pages that you can pull out, um, and, you know, as the DM, distribute to the players at the appropriate times. So this looks like a little map that you might give the players at a key story point. And this looks like some kind of code or puzzle. And I'm really glad that these pieces are preserved in here because, uh, you know, they're, they're fun parts of the adventure. And they're in great shape. for the 
the Fiend Folio Tome, I said that TSR Hobbies UK had plans, and this module represents the first of those plans. We sincerely hope you like it, and the others which will follow. Fun. So I guess, uh, I guess D&D took a bit longer to catch on in the UK. If this was published in 81. By that point, I think it was fairly popular already in the States. A lot of modules had been written. <laughs> I guess. Now this module is written in the English which I use, and may therefore appear slightly different in flavor from the language to which the majority of its readers will be accustomed. In one sense, I make no apologies for this. It is an English module, and it would be less than representative if it did not carry something of that atmosphere. In another sense, I am aware that some readers might therefore find this reading slightly unfamiliar. And if this is, if this in any way detracts from their enjoyment of the module, then my apologies are due. <laughs> so, American readers, if you find the text too flowery and florid, or too plain and stilted, the structure of the language slightly unusual, the use of certain words apparently slightly offbeat, these are the reasons. I, I'm not sure, is he throwing shade at American readers? He's like, you dummies, this is the Queen's English. I'm not, I, I think maybe, maybe a little bit. They might be slightly tongue-in-cheek. Perhaps you will take solace in knowing that UK readers of all the other TSR modules have the same reaction in reverse. Ah, uh, that's fun. Very fun. This Don Turnbull was apparently the managing editor of TSR Hobbies in the UK. Good stuff. So, The Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh is designed to be played as the first in a series. Uh, 
raccoon man <laughs> and like a rat man gnawing at his ankles. <laughs>
It says here, at last, an opportunity to avert the threat to the little town of Saltmarsh. The real enemies have been identified. Evil, cruel creatures, massed in force and viciously organized. Can the brave adventurers thwart this evil and ensure the safety of Saltmarsh? Interestingly, it's only for levels 3 to 5, so... And Salt Marsh, the first part, is for levels 1 to 3, so I guess the middle piece is for levels 2 to 4, I suppose. But there's not a whole lot of advancement to be had there. It sounds like you're not going to be leveling up often. And it seems like there's quite a bit of adventure in between. Uh, you know, so. Meow. Laser blast. So here we have, um, a map drawn by lizard men. Rising sun symbol indicates east. south orientation but uh it's kind of like this uh, cavern system it says here this is the lower level and here are the upper and middle level middle levels fairly crude looking maps but i guess that's by design so this is, once again, something you would give your players as a DM. Here we have an interesting piece of art. <laughs> Spiky helmet guy. Uh, level 1, level 2, level 3 of... Uh, South Sawan Sawan Lair Sawagin 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 Lair. We'll say Sawagin. This one has suffered a bit of damage, but not too bad. Just a little, just a little dog-eared and slightly ripped.
BDSM vibes here. I, don't, I wish I could explain, but I can't. Oh well. I'm sure if I were to read more carefully or more thoroughly, maybe that's the Baroness. It talks about the living quarters of the Baroness. series 
of Three Adventures, all of which were written by Gary Gygax, the uh, originator, one of the co-creators of D&D. Three Adventures for character levels 8 through 12, it says here. We've got some art of questionable quality on the front. A lady running with her child clutched to her chest. Um, what we must assume are angry giants just smacking the crap out of a couple of dudes. These guys are having a bad day. It says here, this material was originally published as three separate adventures. G1, the stitting of the giant chief. G2, the glacial rift of the frost giant Jarl. And G3, Hall of the Fire Giant King. Contained herein are a referee notes, because in the early days they would often refer to the GM or the DM as the referee. Uh, background information, maps, and exploration keys for three complete adventures using the AD&D rules. This module can be used alone or as the first in a series of adventures that includes dungeon modules D1 to D2 and D3 and Q1. So, um, Descent into the Depths of the Earth and Vault of the Drow and Queen of the Demon Web Pits, I believe I have in this pile. I think we looked at one or all of those last time. Pretty sure. Um, this is an older series of adventures originally developed in 1978. Um, although this combined module with all three uh, was probably published in 81 based on the copyright here. And uh, apparently it was used as a tournament module um, in 79 for Origins. Not sure what that was. Maybe a, a convention of some kind or something. There, there's the images of the original three. Adventure. 
warriors must deliver a sharp check, deal a lesson to the clan of hill giants nearby, or else return and put their heads upon the block for the headsman's axe. Yikes. Yet this charge is not as harsh as it may seem, for all have been fully equipped with all standard items needed for both wilderness and dungeon exploration. It's a typo. It says wilderness and dungeon exploration. I don't even see that. And, rather than and. Um, and each member of the party has likewise been given the finest horse available. Guides are available to help, and the leader has a splendid map <laughs> showing exactly where the great timber fortress of the chief of the hill giants in the area is. This chief, one Nosnra, <laughs> is a grossly fat and thoroughly despicable creature, sly and vicious, loving ambush and backstabbing. Furthermore, the party has been cautioned to expect a secret some motivational power being this un or behind again a typo it says behind being behind this unusual banding of different races of giants more surprises might be in store finally the party's been instructed to keep any and all loot they chance upon this to be their reward for the perils they are to face there to follow any clues discovered in such point, if such point towards the sinister hand suspected of guiding the rising, but to return at once if they should determine exactly the reason or force behind the unholy alliance. Some relic of great evil might be at hand. So, uh, a, a pretty straightforward setup, really, but I bet you there's more to it than that. I bet you there's more to it, as, as is hinted at. <laughs> it's like a fight in the giant's kitchen. Kind of scary centipede. A lot of these older adventures are more sort of straightforward. Adventures, <laughs> dungeon crawls, you know, very um, uh, cleanly laid out in terms of, you know, the sort of challenge available. But um, not all of them. Some of them definitely have twists and turns. And this is kind of fun art. Some of them definitely have some more subtlety. Spooky. That's that's nightmare material right there. Don't like that one bit. You can see how like somebody's actually circled certain things here. <laughs> so this was played through. You can see one of the challenges with these older modules is that oftentimes the staples start to rust. You got these rust stains. is happening here. Uh, there's a very angry bear with a spiky collar and a very cute baby bear down here. He looks so confused. He's like, I am baby, what is this? Don't even know what's happening. Uh, and then an angry giant, uh, perhaps ambushing our adventurers. Giants. A treasure chest. Fighting the giants. This one has a wolf, perhaps. Um, an imprisoned lady, I guess. That says here, human female. Chained to the wall. She's a thief. She will gladly admit to being a thief caught trying to find the king's treasure room and volunteer to aid the party faithfully for a 
chance to escape. If opportunity presents itself, she will heist as much in gems and magic as she can and then slip away. But until then, she will actually help the party. Of course, during this time, she will be casing each character to learn what he or she carries. Shifty character indeed. That's terrifying. It is. 
is my honor to right now read to you our Fus Roda patrons and YouTube members for this video. Starting with Drummer Brit, Angel Garcia, Odinson, Rango Steel, Jake Lofney, K Time, Ragnar Ragnarsson, and Skad Vanna. An absolutely legendary group of folks, and I cannot thank them enough, which is why I thank them again and again every single video. I, I deeply appreciate the incredibly kind support that they provide, and that of all the uh, supporters here. It allows me some freedom to continue to make the kinds of content that I enjoy the most, and that hopefully you really enjoy listening to and watching as well. So, once again, if you are interested in supporting what I do here on the channel in a more direct fashion and unlocking some fun perks like your name in these credits, like early access to my weekend videos, and much more along the... Well, okay, maybe not much more, but more. There is more at higher tiers <laughs> along the way. Please consider checking out those links down below at the top of the video description. And one more big thank you to all of our amazing channel supporters here. 